Hello and welcome to CS11 Lecture 6. In today's lecture, we'll wrap up topics related to Chapter 3, including string comparisons, input validation, and flowcharts. You should watch this lecture after you've completed Lecture 5, Lab 5, and then viewed the discussion about Lab 5 and Lab 5B. First, a little bit about flowcharts, which are discussed in section 3.5 of the textbook. It's a nice um, discussion and you should check it out. Now flowcharts are a formal mechanism to show the structure of decisions and tasks that are required to solve a problem. Now you'll remember in the Lab 5 solution and discussion that on paper I kind of made a list of what my possibilities were when I was trying to find the maximum of several values. Now whether you adopt informal mechanisms like I used on paper or a formal mechanism like flowchart, it's critical for you to develop the good habits of planning a program out on paper before you begin coding it. And that will be one of your most important strategies for becoming a successful programmer. Let's talk next about string comparisons. Previously, we talked about relational operators. Greater than, greater than or equal to, less than, less than or equal to, the test for equality, and the test to see if two things are not equal. And we use these with numeric values, but these same relational operators also work with string values in C++. Now, how do you compare strings, or what does it mean for a string to be greater or less than another string. When you compare strings, it's done on a character by character basis. If you have two strings that you're comparing, it will compare the first character. And only in the case of a tie does it go on to examine the second character. In this case, because both of these strings start with a lowercase h, we would then next compare the E and the O of these words. All right, well, how does the comparison of E and O work out? Well, it actually, it all comes back to a new numeric comparison after all. And it's based on what's called the ASCII code. It stands for American Standard Code for Information Interchange. Here, I've brought up the Wikipedia page for ASCII. And included here is an ASCII chart or an ASCII table. And it shows for each character, such as a capital A, what its equivalent value here in decimal, 65. So in C++, the character A has an equivalent value of 65. And a B has a value of 66, and so on. A Z, we can read off the table, has a value of 90. A lowercase a has a value of 97, and so on. And so when you do a comparison, that's how it relates the ideas of greater than or less than to the characters in a string. All right, let's code a sample program that does a little bit of string comparison. Okay, here we've got a starter program, and let's prompt the user. To enter their name, let's create a string variable called name. And then let's have the user input their name. Here, I'll use the stream uh, extraction operator. All right, now let's check to see if the user enters my name, okay? You could do this same example with your name here.
Okay, let's compile and run this program. Let's see. Oh, not on the desktop. Wrong location. Let's try that again. Okay, and let's run the program. And I type in my name, Steve, and I run the program a second time, and I type in my name. Notice that it didn't match this time. That's because, according to the ASCII code, a capital S and a lowercase s are not the same. A capital S has a value of 83, a lowercase s a value of 115, and when the computer compares those, it says, oh, that's not the same thing. And so, therefore, it didn't match here. Now, how could I get, if you typed in uh, my name in all lowercase letters, we could use the OR command, which is written as two vertical bars, and also, like the AND we talked about previously, connects two logical expressions. The OR gives us a result of true if either one or both of our logical expressions is true. So all of these combinations will get us a value of true. And using an OR will only get you a value of false if both of the logical expressions that it connects is false. So here I'll say if name equals Steve or if name equals Steve in lowercase. And now this statement here will be true if either one of these conditions are true. Now it turns out that it would be impossible for them to both be true at the same time because this string would have to be one or the other. Okay, let's compile the program and run. And I'll type my name in uppercase and that works and I'll type my name in, in lowercase and notice in both times it now matches. Now, what if I wanted to accept every combination of upper and lowercase letters? Well, that would be a pretty long list. In fact, we can figure out how many it is numerically. The value is 2 to the 5, which is 32. So I, there's 32 possible ways that I can write my name just with the letters Steve using upper or lowercase for each letter. And that would be a pretty long list. And if I wanted to allow someone to type in my name in any case, then I would want to use a different technique to check to see that the string was Steve. And the way that you would do that is by converting the input into an arbitrary case. For example, converting everything you've typed in into lowercase and then just comparing it to this one entry here. That's going to be the subject of the next lab exercise, where um, I'll have you do that. The last topic for today's lecture is the idea of input validation. Or, I like to think of it as supporting robust input. When you have a computer program and you ask the user for input, you never know what crazy thing they're going to type in. And wouldn't it be nice if we could make our program be able to deal with all of those situations? For example, in your programs, you've perhaps done some input into a variable where that variable was an integer, or perhaps it was a double. And you may have observed, if the user doesn't type in something that the computer can recognize, that the program would crash or otherwise do something that's unpredictable or undesirable. So the textbook has some coverage of this idea in section 3.8. And unfortunately, the coverage of it is a little bit substandard. And that's because this is a little bit of a tricky issue. In that section of the textbook, they use things like cn.fail and cn.ignore and I recommend that you avoid these commands entirely. Well then, how would you go about writing a program that has robust input so that typing in bad values doesn't crash the program? And the answer is very simple. 
input everything as a string. That's the solution. If everything that you input is treated as a string, it's not possible for the user to type in anything that would crash the program. For example, if you were inputting as an integer, if the user types in 19, that works, but if the user types in hello, that would crash your program. But if you treat everything as a string, and the user types in 19, then you have a string with a 1 and a 9, and if they type in hello, then you have a string with an H and E and so on. And in either case, that input is then legal. Well, what if you needed an integer value, though? Doing the input as a string only keeps your program from crashing, but it doesn't give you an integer value. And so in order to complete this picture and make robust input, you also need to know how to convert from a string to some other type of variable, such as an integer or a double. Let me tell you how to do this. And I'm going to mention three methods. First of all, I'm going to mention the old and simple method for doing this that comes all the way from the C programming language. Then I'm going to mention the modern complex method of doing this that you normally use in C++ and then a new also some somewhat simple mechanism for doing this that is new to the very uh, recent version of C++ known as C++ 11 or the 2011 standard of C++. That's right, even though C++ is a language that's been around for a long time, it's still evolving and uh, new things are still coming into the language. This method, which I'll just mention briefly by the way, will probably not work for you because most compilers that you're being using or that you would have access to have not been updated to this standard yet. So even though 2011, well, that sounds like ancient in computer times, a couple of years ago, it was a very complex undertaking to upgrade all of our tools that we use to make them support that standard. All right, the uh, old and simple method had two functions called a to i and a to f, which stands for array to integer and array to float. And the a for array comes from a character array. So these methods predate the existence of the string class. And if you use them with a string that has a numeric value in it, you then have to convert to a character array first. So for example, s dot c underscore str. Or a to f, s dot c underscore str. And if s has got a string in it that starts off with a numeric value, then either one of these commands will give you an integer value or a, a float, which you could then assign to either an integer or a double variable in your program. Either of these methods will work for you, and I do recommend their use. Next up, a more modern and slightly more complex method in C++ is going to use something called a string stream. And I'll demonstrate a program that does that in just a moment. Basically, what you do with a string stream is you pretend that you're outputting the value, such as you would to see out, and then you can read it back in in a different format, just like you would with CN. Now, it doesn't actually use C out and CN. It uses the string stream to do that. This is pretty tricky, and believe it or not, is pretty much the standard way to do this conversion between a, a string to an either an int or a double. Lastly, there's a new or much simpler method in C++, and it uses the commands s to i and s to d for string to integer or string to double. And since you're unlikely to have access to tools that support those methods, I won't demonstrate them. I'll just mention that they're there. But within a few years, perhaps every compiler out there will also support those functions. Okay, well, let me demonstrate some of these methods in a sample program. Here I'll say, enter a string 
with an integer. Okay. Now, I'm going to want to be able to enter more complex strings, ones that are more than one single word. So rather than using the CN method, let's use the getLine method. And let's rename that string variable. Instead of name, let's call it input, which is a less descriptive name. Name was something specific, but now it's not a name anymore. So wouldn't want to use that name. Uh, name as the name of our variable. All right, now let's create an integer named value, and we'll be able to get that value from the string. Let's first use the a to i command, a to i, and the name of our string is input dot c underscore str. All right, let's compile and run that program and enter a string with an integer, 99 red balloons, hit enter, and it says your value is 99. And that's stored in integer value, so now I can proceed to do numeric operations with it. If I wanted to do doubles, then, and we'll change this to a double, and instead of using a to i, we'll use the command a to f. And here I'll say enter a string with a double. I'll compile the program again and run it. Enter a string with a double, 356 per pound. And notice there, that extracts the value of 356. The numeric value has to come first. So here, if I run the program, Price is 356 per pound. Notice here it says the value is zero. And that's because it started at the beginning of the string and said price, that's not a number, and it gave me back a zero. Now, it would still be possible to um, extract that 356 from this string, but now it's a more complex operation because you have to work your way past this portion of the string and get here, get to extract this portion here. And so you can see why in the textbook they were tempted to just show you these commands dot fail and dot ignore and not deal with a slightly more complex situation of how you should actually be doing these operations. All right, well let me show you one more example of using uh, the modern method which is to do a string stream and in order to do that we're going to need another pound include And we have to include the library called sStream for string stream. Now we've got our input. Now we need to create a string stream. And the way to do that, string stream, and we'll give it a name. I'll call it buffer because it's a place that I'm going to store information into temporarily and take it out later. And then in parentheses, the name of the string that you want to convert. So the string, our string variable is called input, and so this will take that string and store it in here. And now we can get our output from the buffer by treating it like an input source, just like you would with CN. But instead of reading from CN, we're going to read from buffer, and let's store it into a double called you. All right, save, compile, and run the program. And there, once again, I've got my value. All right, so there's a brief overview of how to convert a value from a string to either an integer or a double, and that is the proper way to make your program have more robust input if you decide to do that. Now, is that going to be required? No, for most of our programs, you're not going to be required 
to have robust input. So if I, I have you code a program for me where you, I say you're going to write a program that inputs three integers, when I go to test your program, I'll only type in three integers. If I need you to write a program that um, can deal with any kind of input, that'll be explicit as part of the directions of the assignment. All right, thank you.